Thank you so much for joining us. If you have your Bibles with you, if you would just turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to get there in just a little bit. But before we do that, we're going to share a few, I'm going to share a few things with you guys uh, based on the series that we've been involved in with uh, Free Indeed. Today's message is called Position for Freedom. And uh, if you have your version app, you can go to uh, version app, go to events and then search for Rev City and the notes will show up there for you. The basis for experiencing freedom is discovering who we are in Christ, what he's already accomplished for us, what we have in him, and how he has positioned us in the heavenly realm as a result of what he has done. Walking through the process of believing and receiving freedom helps us to see the areas of struggle in our life and then to overcome those areas. Satan is our enemy. He's real and he's our enemy. And as the God of this world, he used to have us under his dominion. However, once we surrendered our lives to Jesus, he no longer has that dominion anymore. Now, we know he doesn't play by the rules. He's a deceiver. And he hides the truth or he distorts it from us. He operates in our past so that he can keep us from the provision of the present and of the future. The enemy of our soul hates freedom and the power that is rightfully ours, so he exploits areas of our lives. I'm going to call them five root issues, five areas in our lives in which we can all struggle. And then that, at that place of struggle, he, he deceives us to the point of discouragement and despair that causes a hopelessness to come into our lives. His object is to steal, kill, and destroy. But we have good news. We have good news that there's something that has been done through Jesus Christ and something that we can partner with to be done and this morning, I want to give you a quick overview of five root issues, five access points where the enemy comes into our lives to insert his demonic influence. And understanding what these five issues are will help you to look at those access points in your life individually where Satan has got a foothold. And from there, then you can begin to step, uh, step into it with an ax to cut the root issue out of your life and kill all the fruit. Pastor Thomas has touched over the last couple of weeks on some of these issues, but I want you to hear them again, and I want you to internalize them so that you really begin to understand how the enemy works in your life. <clears throat> From there, I want to pivot and help you to understand that through Jesus Christ, you and I are uniquely positioned for freedom to deal with those root causes and to step into the freedom that we've create, been created for. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm going to say this. I didn't say this in the first service. I'm going to say it now. You have to participate with me. When I say something awesome, which is going to be most of the message, I need you to go, yes, amen, Eddie. That's awesome. Okay, okay there you go. Yes. Come on. And if you don't, we have our ushers uh, already informed them to escort you out as quickly, as quietly as possible. <laughs> Five root issues, okay? These are access points where the enemy wants to come into your life and grab a foothold. I need you to write these down. These are important because for the rest of your life, you'll need to understand what these access points are so that when you struggle, you can determine very quickly what it is and deal with it, okay? The first one is unforgiveness. And this is one that I um, uh, think is probably one of the harder ones to deal with, and this is why. Because forgiveness is exactly what reconciled us to the Father, when, when, when God forgave us, when we received his forgiveness, it restored us into a relationship with the Father. So unforgiveness causes a breach in that relationship. The Word of God says if you, uh, will, be, if you will forgive, then you will be forgiven. But if you will not forgive, then you will not be forgiven. So the enemy comes in with unforgiveness into our lives to bind us up and to establish a breach between us and God the Father so that our prayers are hindered and we're in bondage. So unforgiveness is number one. The second one is willful sin. 
You guys all know what this is. This is something that is sinful. You know it's sinful, but you choose to do it anyway. Okay, I had a guy one time years and years ago, and he was caught up in this. We were walking through this freedom stuff, and I said, you know that sin that you're caught up in there, right? You enjoy that sin, do you not? And he said, no, 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 I don't want to, no, I want to, that's why I'm here. I want to get rid of the sin. I said, I know, but I need you to be honest with me. You're enjoying that sin right now, are you not? No, no, well, no, no, no. Really? Really? All right. Yeah, I enjoy that sin. Okay, here's what you got to do. Stop. Well, how can I stop? Okay, whatever you got to do, stop. If that means get an accountability partner, if that means putting a filter on your computer, if that means just turning off the TV, stop. It's something that you enjoy, but stop it. It's sin. It's creating a distance between you and your family. It's creating a distance between you and your spouse. Stop. You know it's wrong, but you willfully choose to sin. The third one is a tough one. It's hurts and traumas where people have come into your life or situations have come into your life or experiences that you've had in your life where you have a hurt and a trauma. Sometimes it's the separation of family. It's, it's a near-death experience. It's a bunch of different things where hurt has come in. And from that hurt, the enemy sneaks his way in there. And he says stuff like this, like, well, that's what happens when you get into that kind of relationship. You shouldn't let that happen again. Or you, you deserve that. That's what you set up. And so all these hurts and these traumas are access points for the enemy. The fourth one is a generational iniquity. And iniquity is simply just a bent towards a thing. An example I could give you in generational iniquities is uh, families that have uh, suffered through addictions, where you can see generation after generation after generation after generation, there's an addiction pattern in their family. That's a generational iniquity. For some families, it's divorce. For some families, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, I said addictions already. So for some families, it's poverty, where you see a cycle of poverty. Generationally, it's over and over and over. And the enemy uses that. And I've had people tell me this before. They say, well, this is just, we've been dealt a bad hand. Can I tell you something? God doesn't uh, deal bad hands. Winning hands only. But the enemy comes in. And through a cycle of poverty and generations after generation after generation. So the enemy establishes that as a foothold and says, well, you're always going to be poor. That's just your lot in life. You were dealt a bad hand. Number five is a mental stronghold. Mental stronghold. It could be an emotional stronghold, but generally it starts in the, in the head. A mental stronghold is this, where you have a thought process that disagrees, that does not line up with the word of God. And what happens with mental strongholds, this is something that, uh, you know, you can't cast those out. Those aren't demons. Those are something that we develop ourselves. So you have an unhealed hurt that comes into your life. Somebody hurts you. It's legit. It happened. And the stronghold is this. You get a brick and you make it up and you go, I am never going to let anybody hurt me again. And then somebody hurts you again like, well, I just need another brick. I am never going to hurt, let anybody hurt me again. And before, wall, before long, you have a wall, a stronghold that keeps everybody out because you're not going to let anybody else hurt you again. But it also keeps God from being able to heal that hurt. Now, here's the thing. Like I said, a mental stronghold is not a demonic spirit. It can't be cast out. It's something that you have to pull down. We pull down strongholds. And the God has given us the word of God to pull those things down. And so here's the thing you need to know about strongholds as well, is that a mental stronghold, any way you have a mental stronghold in your life, what you're saying, whether you realize it or not, is I am the Lord of my life in that area. So when I say I am never going to let anybody hurt me again, what I'm saying is I'm the Lord of my life in that area. And guess who isn't the Lord of your life in the area of your relationships? God. When you have a mental stronghold of poverty, I am never going to be poor again. Guess who's not the Lord of your life and your finances? Because you've decided you're going, to not going to be, you're going to do whatever you can, not whatever God can, whatever you can, to be the Lord of your life in that particular area. So we have to pull down those strongholds. Unforgiveness, willful sin, 
unhealed hurt and trauma, generational curses, and also word curses can go with that as well, and then mental strongholds. A word curse is simply speaking about yourself in a way that's contrary to the word of God. Have you ever looked in the mirror and maybe said something like, oh, you're so ugly, or you're so stupid, or you're so skinny, or you're so, it's just negative, negative, negative. You're speaking death over yourself as opposed to life. God says, I set before you two choices. Death and life, curses and blessing. Choose. Then he goes, choose life and blessing. He gives you the answer. He tells you what to choose. And now here's, here's what I understand, is that in order to stop cursing yourself, you're going to have to be quiet a lot. That's okay. In the name of Jesus, shut up. I mean, really, if you're not going to speak life over yourself, zipit.com. All right, here's the thing. We are who the word of God says that we are. Can I, can I get an amen for that one? Yes. Here's what I know. <laughs> we act like the people that we believe we are. So here's a trick. Why don't we believe what the word of God says that we are? Okay? Now I understand this takes time, but let's get there. Let's walk in newness of life and freedom. See, the enemy, as I said a minute ago, he tries to hide or distort the truth of our true identity in Christ from us. So we have to start somewhere, right? So let's start here. How about salvation? How about our salvation when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, God begins to start a regeneration in us, okay? We've gone from death to life. We're born again. That's a good thing. We go from darkness to light. Ephesians 5, where I told you to turn a minute ago, says this. Once your life was full of sin's darkness, but now you have the very light of the Lord shining through you because of your union with him. Your mission is to live as a child flooded with his revelation light. You have a new identity. You have gone, listen to me, say identity with me, identity. identity. Okay, not everybody believe. Identity. identity. Identity, not behavior, okay? You have gone from a sinner to a saint. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, for God has made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That is your identity now. You've gone from a fish to a sheep. Matthew 18 says, and he said to them, follow me. He's speaking to the disciples and he goes, and I will make you fishers of men. But once you were captured by the Lord, you were caught in his net you became a sheep. John chapter 10, verse, thir- verse 3 and then 14 says, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And then Jesus speaking of himself says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. From this salvation and regeneration, we are given a divine nature. Second Peter says this, everything we could ever need for life and for godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. For all of this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. As a result of this, he has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price. So that through the power of these tremendous promises, we could experience a partnership with the divine nature by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are of the world. 
there's a genetic imprint of how God created you and I that begins to take hold, we're, we're, and that enables us to be like Jesus, not just act like Jesus. You see, we're not on a performance standard with God. God knows that we can't solve this sin issue in our lives by simply improving our behavior. That's why at salvation, when we surrender our lives, we have an opportunity to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to allow him to begin to position us for freedom so that we're sanctified, which is simply saying he's removed the sin, he's purified my life, and fill us with the truth of God's word. See, the problem is, through those five access points, we're so full of that stuff that the demonic is trying to influence us that we can't get truth into us, get God's truth into us. So we need to purge ourselves of those five areas so that God's truth can be rooted and grounded in us. Amen? Amen. It's about positioning ourselves for freedom. And the first position is your identity position. You have received a new life as salvation. Colossians 3 says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You received God's righteousness. Philippians 3, 9 says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. There's a story that Jesus tells of a Pharisee and a tax collector in a temple. And on one end, you have the Pharisee, and he's he's looking really, you know, Pharisaical, I guess. And and he says, God, thank you that I'm, I'm not like those other sinners. Man, thank you especially that I'm not like that tax collector over there. God, I tithe. I fast. Thank you that I'm not like that guy, a sinner. And there's a tax collector on the other side of the temple and he won't even lift his head. He's bowed down, humble. He said, God, I'm a sinner and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. Two people, very different outcomes. One, the Pharisee is standing in his own righteousness. The tax collector is asking for the righteousness of Jesus. And Jesus said, that man left justified. So we have new life, we have righteousness. We've been exalted. According to Ephesians chapter two, verse six, we've been raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places In Christ Jesus, we've been reconciled. 2 Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ in God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and trusting us with the message of reconciliation. Listen, your identity is now that you are reconciled and that reconciliation with God, you were given a ministry to help other people be reconciled to God as well. Part of your identity is that you're empowered. Luke 10 says, now you understand that I have imparted to you, this is Jesus speaking, my authority to trample over his kingdom, speaking of the enemy. You will trample upon every demon before you and overcome every power that Satan possesses. Absolutely nothing will harm you as you walk in this authority. That's your identity. You've been given authority. You've been given power. The authority here is this. It's permission. It's right It's liberty. It's the Greek word exousia. The power that you've been given is dunamis. It's ability. It's the power energy source of almighty God. Dunamis is where we get the word dynamite. 
the source of that authority and that power came first for Jesus and his resurrection. Ephesians 1.20 says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he put all things, say all things, under his feet and gave him head over all things, say all things, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. At the resurrection, the same Holy Spirit that's in you and I raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him and established his rule, his reign, his authority, and his power forever and ever in that age and the age that is to come. And it's that same source, that same authority, that same power that Jesus Christ gave us in his resurrection that's resident inside of you. Amen. Ephesians 2 says, but God, rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ because by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the head and was exalted and resurrected. And at that point of resurrection, he put everything under his feet, head and feet. And then he took you and I, his body, and he put us together in that same place where he was seated, in the heavenly realm. And he said, everything is under your feet as well. This combined, this combined power, this combined authority is right and might working together. It puts us in a different position than we were when we were stuck in those five root issues. It's a position of authority that you now carry. And here's how you carry that, sub, that position of authority, by submission. From the place of submission, we'll find the right position. James chapter four says it this way. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have the authority in you to cause the enemy to flee from you, but you have to submit to God. You have a position that's protected, of protection, a position of protection where you stand. Our position is under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a position sealed by covenant because God is a covenant God. And it allows us to be clothed, not in our own strength, but in the armor of God. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, to be fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. To have a shield of faith so that there's no weapon formed against you that would prosper. To have the helmet of salvation placed upon you to have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, available to you, not only defensively, but offensively. And then be encouraged to pray in the spirit at all times. You stand protected. That is your position, not of anything that you've done, but everything that God has done and clothed you with. From this position of submission, of protection, now we posture ourselves in that authority. That posture is, exact, is, is what we exercise. That posture of faith. That posture of confidence. That posture of maturity. The posture is this. I'm in right standing with God. I've looked at every access point that the enemy might have and I've got myself clean. Now I'm taking authority over the enemy, not because of my righteousness, because of Jesus' righteousness, and no more, Satan. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to stop that sin. 
I'm going to have the Holy Spirit heal my heart from that trauma that I've experienced. I'm going to break every generational curse to the third and fourth generation so I can walk in the blessing of a thousand generations. I'm going to stop speaking to myself negatively. Yeah, I know that means I've got to shut up, but I'm going to shut up. And I'm going to take every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm going to pull down every stronghold that's in my life so that I stand in the authority of righteousness as a child of the Most High God. It's the confidence that comes, an authority of confidence comes because listen, when the enemy comes at you and he's going to try to come at you at a flood, as soon as you try to walk free, understand the enemy's going to come. But listen, God is going to raise a standard up against him through his word that you have in your hand. It's like no more. And it's not an arrogance, it's a confidence that says, enemy, I'm not doing that. I'm not playing your games anymore. You've deceived me for long enough. No more. I've got a confidence because greater is in he that is in me than he that is in the world. Now there's a demonstration. It's a faith and assurance that God is with me. And if he's with me, who can be against me? From that place of being positioned for freedom, because you've looked at all the access points, you've got your bases covered, and God is working you through a process, you begin to understand something. First, that you're being free. You're beginning to walk free in areas of struggle that you've had. All of a sudden, the hurt that was really there and difficult to deal with now has been healed. All the temptation for sin is no longer there. You've put that beside you. You're moving on. The generational curses that you see in your life, and by the way, those generational curses, whether they're uh, poverty or uh, addiction or whatever, God can set you free from all those things. But you don't look like that anymore. And again, you have that mind of Christ. You're, you're thinking God thoughts instead of just your own thoughts. From that place, you're positioned for freedom. And here's what I know about free people. Free people, free people. When God sets you free, you can't help but want to see other people free because it feels good to be free. And so free people begin to free other people. Jesus, our mediator and our advocate, has broken the authority over the, uh, of the enemy over our lives. He's completed the work to make us free, and now he releases us to, and to work in us and through us to see other people get set free. Here's how it happens. You know, there's, you've heard of that, the physical law for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, there's also spiritual law. And for every action of the kingdom of darkness... There is an overwhelming and overpowering action of the kingdom of God in the opposite direction. Our God is greater. Romans 5.20 says it this way. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Sin came in with an action, and grace came in with an overwhelming and overpowering reaction in the opposite direction. For every action of the kingdom of God, there is a weaker action of the kingdom of darkness. We have a big God and a small devil. I got two, I got one amen and a right on that one, because most of you, I don't believe that. Most of you, what people think, really, and I deal with this all the time, big God, big devil. No. Big God created Devil. Yes? yes. <laughs> Let me go over here. Yes? Yes, yes. okay. See. <laughs> see, he's so good. He deceives us into thinking he's big. Here's what happens. You get set free. You begin to walk in freedom. And the enemy comes at you. He's like, oh, you want to fight? You want to fight? Okay. And you're like, Oh, oh, oh. Maybe not. Maybe that's just me. 
But you got to get that, you know that uh, Wyatt Earp on you. You know what I mean? Like, no, 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 not Wyatt Earp. What's the other guy's name? Come on, help me out here. I can't be the only one that loves Tombstone. Doc Holliday. Yeah, right? I'm your huckleberry. Because you've got something inside of you, a divine nature, an authority, an empowerment from God because of what Jesus did on the cross, that there is no weapon formed against you that will prosper. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul sees the church, you, positioned for freedom. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his might. He's positioned us for freedom. We have to walk it out. I want you to think on those five areas, those five access points. Unforgiveness, willful sin, unhealed hurt and trauma, generational iniquity or word spoken curses, and mental strongholds. And what I want you to do is I want you to sit before the Lord and say, God, am I battling in any, any one of those areas? And then be quiet and allow Holy Spirit to show you. He will, he's so faithful. And when he shows you that, I want you to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you feel shame, if you feel guilt, if you feel condemnation, I want you to know that the enemy has tried to infiltrate that conversation between you and God. Simply say to him, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, leave me alone. But listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Repent and ask God to heal you. Receive his forgiveness and begin to walk in newness of life. If you have struggle in any of those areas, call us. We'll walk with you. I tell people all the time, I will walk with you as long as it takes, but you got to walk. But when you're walking, come on, man. You're going to get, I just know you're going to get set free because God is in the freeing business. Amen? Stand up with me if you would. I'm going to read this scripture over you. This is a scripture that Jesus read in the temple. And after the reading of the scripture, he set the, the scroll down and he looked at everybody as everybody's eyes were upon him and he said, this scripture is fulfilled today in your hearing. He fulfilled this scripture. And I'm gonna read this scripture over you because this is what I believe God would speak over to you to fulfill as well. The spirit of the Lord God is upon you because the Lord has anointed you to bring good news to the poor. He has sent you to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent you to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. He has sent you to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called, that you may be called oaks of righteousness, that you are the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. I began the message speaking about 
it starts at salvation. Gener regeneration begins at salvation, but it takes surrender. Some people will say a prayer, maybe you have an emotion stirred up, but they've never surrendered their life fully to Jesus. And to me, salvation is all about surrender. And if you're here this morning, if you're there online, and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to pray with you. And say, maybe you have served Jesus for a while, but you know what? You're at the place where you've kind of taken over and you need to surrender again. If that's you here, that's you online, I want you to raise your hand for me so I can pray with you. Say, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Maybe for the first time. I want, to God, I want God to come in and save me. If you're there online, you can just put the hand emoji up and just let them know online that you're surrendering to Jesus this morning. At that place of surrender, God will reconcile you back into relationship with him. And so we're going to pray a prayer. If you lifted up your hands, we're going to pray a prayer. And we're going to join you in that prayer. And here's the reason we're going to join you. One, because you're part of a family. The family of God now. And two, it's a good reminder for us that we never graduate from grace. The same grace that saved us, we need every single day of our lives. And you will too. So I want you to pray this prayer with me. And we'll surrender our lives to Jesus fresh and new today. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me that I might be reconciled to you. Today, I surrender my life and ask you to save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to walk in newness of life. Help me to find the freedom position that I might walk completely and totally free. Thank you, God, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a clap off for this morning? Listen, if you surrendered your life today, before you leave here today, if you're in this room, I want you to go to the Welcome Center. We have a Bible we want to put into your hand. That's going to, it's called the Fresh Start Bible. It's going to help you get started on your journey. If you're there online, I want to encourage you to email newlife at revcity.com and we will mail you a Bible and put it into your hands. It's going to greatly help you. So as we stand here this morning, I want you to understand, if you're struggling in those areas, there is no condemnation at all. But now that you know what those areas are, I want you to begin to seeking God on how you can begin to walk free. And if you need help, we're available to you all the time. But listen, don't come for relief. Don't come for relief. If you just want relief, I'll pray for you. I want you to come for freedom to be done with it. Amen? Let's worship the Lord this morning.